Sharon Thor was born on October 28, 1966, in Elizabeth, New Jersey. She was one of five children of Frank Sr. and Sonia Thor, and was the only daughter in the family. While Sharon was growing up, the family moved a few times, first to Roselle, then to Franklin, where they settled. The Thor children initially attended parochial school before switching to the public school system upon relocating to Franklin. In the fall of 1982, Sharon was a student at Franklin Student High School and an avid dancer, having taken lessons since she was in preschool. She was so dedicated to the craft that prior to enrolling in classes, she wore a brace for six months to help straighten her legs, which were turned inward. At the time of her murder, Sharon was just two days shy of her 16th birthday. On the evening of October 26, 1982, Sharon was watching television while her father was relaxing in the living room and her mother was in the kitchen. She answered the phone when it rang around 5.30 p.m. and it appeared as though the call was for her, given her tone and the fact that she stretched the cord as far as it could go so she could talk to the person on the other end with some privacy away from her parents. Immediately after hanging up the phone, Sharon ran out the door without her coat or purse, telling her mother she'd be back shortly. As the pair were to leave for the 15-year-old's dance class at 5.45 p.m., Sonia expected her daughter to return after only a few minutes. However, time ticked by without Sharon coming back to the house. Concerned, Sonia and Frank went to the Franklin Township Police Department to report their daughter missing, but were told they needed to wait 24 hours, as was the protocol back in the 1980s. Knowing they couldn't sit back and wait until the next day, they launched their own search, going to the dance school and places Sharon was known to frequent. Sonia even took the family's German shepherd to a nearby wooded area, but there was no sign of Sharon. Three days after she went missing, on October 29th, Sharon's bludgeoned body was discovered by a search team of firefighters in a wooded area, just a quarter mile from her family's home on Johnny Bush Avenue. Approximately 25 yards from a dirt road and on private property maintained by a utility company, it appeared the persons responsible had attempted to cover up the crime. An autopsy showed Sharon had died from blunt force trauma just one hour after she'd left home on the evening of October 26. Her head and chest had significant injuries, with multiple fractures to her ribs and skull. There were also indications of internal hemorrhaging. While it's believed the 15-year-old was sexually assaulted, given her jeans and sweater were partially removed, this has not been confirmed. Near the body, investigators found a cement cinder block and a 2-inch by 4-inch piece of lumber, which were most likely the murder weapons. Within days of Sharon's body being found, investigators had interviewed 85 people, including family, friends, and persons of interest. Over a dozen detectives from both the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office and the Franklin Township Police Department were assigned to the case, with a number of individuals identified as possibly being involved. However, they were never able to confirm any strong suspects. According to Sonia, many of the parents at Franklin High School didn't want police to speak with their children. She believes someone who knew the area killed Sharon, given the area where her body was found. While owned by the aforementioned utility company and posted with no trespassing signs, there were no fences to keep anyone out, 
and it was an unknown hangout spot for local teens who used it to party, ride dirt bikes, and socialize. Early into the investigation, a child from the neighborhood came forward and said they remembered seeing Sharon getting into a car with a loud muffler and two white men inside, one in the driver's seat who had dark hair and one in the back. The teenager reportedly ran to the vehicle and jumped into the passenger side seat. In 2009, when the case was reopened, it was revealed the pair were likely local to Franklin and either in the teens or early 20s when Sharon was murdered. Along with the police investigation, Sharon's siblings tried to hunt down her murderer. They knocked on doors and talked to a man who they believed was either responsible or knew the individuals who were. Following the case being reopened in 2009, it was announced that a hearing was held regarding new evidence. Talking with the media, a defense attorney representing a possible suspect said they were to be presented with a motion to hold her client in investigative custody, as well as to obtain the unnamed individual's DNA. Nothing has been released publicly regarding the outcome of this hearing. In 2022, the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office reiterated that the case was still being investigated and was in the hands of the Major Crimes Unit. The following year, Sharon's remains were exhumed, presumably to see if there was any additional evidence to be gathered and to collect a usable DNA sample. Unhappy with how the investigation has proceeded, her niece, Sam, has launched a change.org petition asking that more be done to solve her aunt's murder. There are two rewards available for information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for Sharon's murder. Crime Stoppers of Somerset County is offering $5,000, while a community-raised fund has $4,000 in it. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office at 908-231-7100. Tips can also be submitted anonymously via Crime Stoppers of Somerset County at 1-888-577-8477. Catherine Diane Mowry was born on February 5, 1961, to James and Catherine Mowry. She grew up in Kansas alongside her five siblings, Jim, Michael, Mark, Joan, and Deborah. When she was a young adult, Catherine changed her name to Katrina. This was because she was working at a country club where many of the ladies kept calling her by that name. In 1985, Katrina was 24 years old and living on her own in Dallas, Dallas County, Texas. She had left Kansas when she turned 18. According to her niece, Katrina Marshall, she was semi-involved in the local drug scene. In mid-June 1985, Katrina was planning to drive to Kansas to visit Deborah. Prior to the trip, the pair had gotten into an argument over the phone, causing Deborah to hang up on her sister. Despite the anger between the two, Deborah assumed they'd patch things up when Katrina arrived in Kansas. When Katrina didn't arrive, Deborah assumed she was still upset and had decided to cancel her trip without telling anyone. On June 25th of 1985, the manager of the Casa Three Apartments at 200 South Marsalis Avenue, was walking by an alley when she noticed a strong odor coming from a 1978 Ford LTD parked nearby. 
She contacted the Southwest Station of the Dallas Police Department, and when officers arrived, they too smelled something coming from the vehicle's trunk. When they popped open the trunk, they discovered the decomposing nude body of a white female. She had been wrapped in a stained white bedsheet. The body was brought to the medical examiner, who through dental records identified the deceased as Katrina Mowry. Given the level of decomposition, they were unable to note any superficial marks or wounds on the body. However, they were able to conclude Katrina had not been sexually assaulted prior to her death. A toxicology report found no drugs or alcohol in her system. Police initially tried to put Katrina's death down as a suicide. However, it was later deemed to be an unexplained death. It was estimated it had occurred two days prior to her body being found on June 23rd of 1985. According to Deborah, Katrina's death was never publicized to the wider Dallas population with little in the way of media coverage. At the time it occurred, it was reported to be the cause of an overdose, as the toxicology report had yet to be complete. Speaking with the media, one of the sergeants working homicide claimed there was evidence she had taken cocaine prior to her death. Investigators went to Katrina's apartment and found nothing out of the ordinary. There was no evidence of forced entry and nothing was missing. In fact, her glasses and contacts, which she was legally blind without, were found on her nightstand. Her travel bags were also found by the front door, indicating she had planned to make the trip to Kansas to visit her sister. The authorities also spoke with Katrina's boyfriend, after discovering the vehicle in which her body was found belonged to him. He claimed to have no knowledge that she was still in Dallas, as he assumed she had already left for Kansas, and he also had an alibi for the time of her death. He was also unaware that his car was missing, which was not unusual, as Katrina was known to borrow it whenever she made trips back home. According to Deborah, the last person to see her sister was a man known as Pee Wee. The pair were close friends to the point where it's alleged Pee Wee had a crush on Katrina. She was also his drug dealer. Knowing how the pair interacted with each other, Deborah always felt Pee Wee was responsible for Katrina's death. However, authorities were never able to locate and question him and his whereabouts remain unknown. It is widely believed that Katrina's death wasn't taken seriously by the Dallas Police Department due to her involvement in the local drug scene. According to Katrina's niece, investigators misled the family into believing they were actively looking into the case, when in actuality it was left untouched. This caused a divide within the family, along with unresolved anger and resentment. It was also considered a taboo topic and thus was rarely spoken about. Because Trina's niece has had minimal contact with law enforcement and what contact she has had has resulted in their conversations going around in circles. At one point, the investigator she was speaking to was unable to locate Katrina in their database and accused the family of passing down stories that are not completely accurate. As for what she believes happened to her aunt, Katrina Marshall said, I never consider any theory off the table completely. However, it's possible it was somehow a situation where someone did panic and needed to hide her body. I'm also equally considerate to the fact that this was a homicide. I say that because of how she was found, naked, wrapped up like a burrito in a bedsheet, along with the fact that she was found across town from where she lived and couldn't have driven herself there because she was legally blind without her glasses or contacts, and both were still on her nightstand next to her bed across town. 
Regardless, law enforcement failed to investigate, failed to bring justice or bring closure to my family, and sadly, not only did they possibly let her killer escape, but they also sentenced her sisters to a life of misery. There are a couple theories. The primary theory in the case is that Katrina was the victim of foul play. This is due to the fact she was found deceased in the trunk of a car across town from where she lived. As well, she was naked and her body had been wrapped in a bed sheet. It seems unlikely someone would strip, wrap themselves in a sheet, and lock themselves in the trunk of a car if they were intending on harming themselves, as police first theorized. As well, Katrina would have had to been transported to the alley by another party, as she was legally blind without her glasses or contacts, both of which had been left at her apartment. Unfortunately, the state of her remains made it difficult to impossible for the medical examiner to determine if she had any superficial marks on her body that could have been caused by a weapon. The second theory is that Katrina died of an accidental overdose and whoever she was with, likely Pee Wee, panicked and tried to hide her body. In an attempt to distance themselves from her death, the person or persons involved drove the body across Dallas and hid the car in an alley. However, this goes against the findings of the toxicology report, which stated she had no illicit drugs in her system at the time of her death. If she had died of an overdose, there would have been some indications of drugs in her system, especially as she was found just two days after her death. In 2021, Katrina's niece set up a change.org petition to help gain the case more attention in the hopes of prompting the Dallas Police Department to restart their investigation. On the webpage, she expressed her frustration over how her aunt's death has been handled, writing, after numerous attempts to contact, communicate, request information, give information, and investigating this case on my own with minimal to no response, communication, or contact from any of the departments within the Dallas Law Enforcement Division slash departments or governing offices, I'm now forced to make this matter public in hopes of gaining the attention of the higher courts slash officials to assist with getting some answers, justice, and most importantly, closure. Katrina's parents have since passed away, as have her two sisters. Joan was the victim of a homicide in Dallas in April of 1993, for which there were criminal proceedings. Deborah sadly took her own life in November 2020, due to the pain caused by her sister's unexplained death. Those with information regarding the case can forward their information to the Homicide Unit of the Dallas Police Department at 214-671-3661 or its General Investigations Line at 214-671-3503. Tips can also be sent to Katrina Marshall on Twitter at Katrina Marsh 91. Tracy Lynn Kirkpatrick was born on June 9, 1971, to parents Bill and Diane. She was the third of four children, which also included her sisters, Angie and Dionda, and brother Jack. While Tracy was born in East Liverpool, Ohio, the family would later relocate to Point of Rocks, Maryland. Those who knew Tracy describe her as being both funny and smart with a feisty attitude. She had a good sense of humor with a love for people and her friends recall her constantly blasting the radio in her 10-year-old Pontiac Grand Prix, which she had bought with her own money. 
Tracy also had a more reserved side to her and was known for being quiet and shy. She was an introspective young woman who liked her independence and was known for not allowing her picture to be taken. She was also compassionate, a trait which extended to not just her loved ones, but to animals as well. She would often take in strays from around the neighborhood, not wanting to leave them out on their own. At 17 years old, Tracy was in her final year at Brunswick High School. She was an honor student with a GPA that sat between 3.5 and 4.0. She had an interest in writing poetry and often expressed her feelings through her work. The majority of her poems spoke of loneliness, and one was published in the New American Poetry Anthology. Given her dedication to her schoolwork, it came as no surprise to those who knew her that she'd had her whole life planned out. Upon graduating, she was set to attend St. Mary's University to study accounting with the hope of later getting accepted into law school. The evening of March 15, 1989, saw Tracy working her first solo closing shift at Aliens Women's Sportswear, located within the West Ridge Shopping Center in Frederick, Maryland. It was one of two part-time jobs the young girl held in order to pay for university in the fall. At around 6 p.m., Diane stopped by the store to bring Tracy some dinner and found her alone reading a book. The pair chatted for a bit, with Tracy telling her mother that she had planned to head straight to bed upon getting home that night. Two hours later, at around 8 p.m., Tracy's manager stopped by the store for a few minutes. It's been noted that the store's cash register did not record any sales after this time, and Tracy was again alone in the store from then onward. When closing time came around at 9 p.m., a security guard named Don Barnes Jr., who also worked as a sheriff's deputy for Frederick County, noticed the store's lights were still on. However, it didn't strike him as odd, as he assumed the cashier on duty was most likely still prepping it for close. He began to grow concerned when at around 10.30 p.m., he circled around again and noticed the lights were still on and the front door was unlocked. He called out but received no response and continued into the score to investigate. He eventually came upon Tracy's body in the back of storeroom. She had been stabbed several times in the chest and back. The police were called not long after. When Tracy didn't return home at her expected time, Bill and Diane decided to drive to the shopping center. They worried their daughter may have experienced car trouble, but also recalled that she had been staying late the previous night because she had been talking with her ex-boyfriend, whom she'd recently started decided to start dating again. When the pair arrived at around 1115, they noticed numerous police cars outside of the store, which worried them. It was not long after that they learned of Tracy's death. Investigators at the scene found no motive for the murder. There was no sign of sexual assault or a struggle, and the store's cash receipts were still on the counter. As the door hadn't been forced open and there was still money in the cash register, robbery was quickly ruled out despite her purse being missing. Blood droplets were found in a rear hallway leading to the store's loading dock and trash bins, and while no weapon was recovered, the wounds Tracy suffered indicated a knife had been used in the attack. As Tracy didn't appear to have any defensive wounds, it was the working theory that she was killed by someone she knew. However, Investigators didn't rule out that the murder could have been committed by a drifter who had been passing through Frederick. Numerous mistakes were made during the initial investigation. The first surrounds the doors at the back of the store, through which the murderer likely escaped. Investigators did not seize them and only examined them through the dim light 
of a flashlight. The second error involved the store's phone records, which were not subpoenaed before the phone company erased them. A man who had been waiting in the front parking lot for his partner spoke with police and shared that he had seen nothing out of the ordinary that night. Given the evidence present, it's believed Tracy was killed between 8 p.m. when her manager stopped by the store and 10.30 p.m. when Don Barnes Jr. discovered her body. Tracy was eventually laid to rest in Oak Grove Cemetery in Freedom, Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh. The case went cold until three months later, when a man called into a nationwide confessions hotline in Las Vegas, Nevada. The hotline was known for charging callers by the minute to record their confessions, which strangers could pay to listen to. The man, who called himself Don, left the following message claiming to be Tracy's murderer. Hello, my name is Dawn, and I'm calling from Frederick, Maryland. I know this is going to sound surprising, but three months ago I stabbed a girl to death, and you might think in making this tape I'm setting myself up to be caught, but there are a lot of guys named Dawn in Frederick. The girl I killed was working in a ladies sportswear store. I often came by and talked to her when she was working alone, and one night she was in the storeroom and we were talking. Our conversation turned into an argument, and so I took out a knife that I have with me at all times, and I killed her. And a few days later, I realized I had created a lot of sadness, and I thought about turning myself into the police. But whatever they do to me, that won't bring Tracy back. So I've decided that I better keep free because we have the death penalty in Maryland. Thanks for listening. I'm sorry about what I did, but nothing can change it. Bye. Upon receiving the call, an attorney for the hotline forwarded the tape to Las Vegas police, who in turn forwarded it to authorities in Frederick. Upon listening to the tape, they were convinced the man calling himself Don was the killer as there was a sincerity in his voice and he knew specific details about the murder. Investigators were able to trace the call to a payphone inside a supermarket in Walkersville, Maryland, approximately eight miles from Frederick. On October 10th of 1989, believing Don was trying to turn himself in, one of the investigators wrote an open letter to him which was published in the front page of the Frederick News Post. It read, I am personally willing to work with you to resolve this tragic situation, and I pray you now will come forward to relieve the hurt, which Tracy's family and friends have suffered, as well as the pain which has consumed your life since that night. Approximately two weeks after the letter was published, a Massachusetts physic by the name of Martha Woodworth contacted the Frederick Police Department, claiming a man she had been in contact with was obsessed with the case, and he had asked her to help him solve it. He said his name was Sean, and he appeared to be fascinated with homicides, especially Tracy's. He had sent her numerous newspaper clippings about the case through the mail, which prompted her to contact the authorities. Hoping they were on to something, investigators played part of the confession tape for Martha. After listening to it, she confirmed that Don and Sean were the same person. A look at the envelope the newspaper clippings had arrived in showed Sean resided in Walkersville, where the phone call had been made back in June. On the first anniversary of Tracy's murder, investigators asked four local radio DJs to play the confession tape in full. The tape was played on the radio station simultaneously, and within two hours, someone had called in to say they recognized the voice. In total, three different individuals would call in and identify the voice as belonging to Sean. The positive ID of Sean being Don led investigators to pay him a visit, 
after which he pleaded the Fifth Amendment and refused to speak with them. It was also learnt that his name was neither Sean nor Don. The next day, they returned to his residence with a search warrant, where they found newspaper clippings and material related to the case items which were sent to the Maryland State Police Crime Lab for analysis. They also obtained a DNA sample. Despite the evidence they had pointing to the unnamed man, police were unable to find enough to file charges against him. They weren't able to confirm he was at the crime scene on on the night of March 15, 1989, or had any involvement, and he's since been cleared as a suspect. To help bring in leads, local merchants put up a $5,000 reward for information. In 1998, a DNA sample from the case was submitted for testing. However, the amount was insufficient to develop a genetic profile of the killer, as was another sample submitted in 2003. In March of 2009, investigators sent away touch DNA for testing to a private contractor with the Maryland State Police, and it has been reported that they have samples from two individuals who are currently suspects in the case. The case has been presented to two cold case review panels over the years, one nationally and another from the Mid-Atlantic region, in the hopes of reinvigorating the investigation. It was also taken to the Vidoc Society which is a group of investigators who evaluate cold cases from across the world. The Frederick Police Department is still actively investigating the case, which is amongst the most well-known in the city. They still continue to receive information, and the Forces Criminal Investigations Division has a full filing cabinet and a couple of drawers devoted to all of the files pertaining to the case. Recently, investigators have gone back and interviewed former detectives who previously worked the case in the hopes of uncovering new clues, and they remain in regular contact with the Kirkpatrick family. According to the police department, each new detective who takes over the case becomes personally affected by it. They consult with predecessors, discuss any new developments, annually review the case, and consider any new ideas. There are many theories in this case. The primary theory in the case is that the security guard, Don Barnes Jr., is responsible for Tracy's murder. According to his daughter, he was abusive toward her and her mother, and as such, she believes he was involved in the killing. His father was a former sheriff with Frederick County, which has led some to suggest that a potential cover-up has occurred in order to protect Don Barnes Jr. The second theory is presented by a detective who worked on the case between 1992 and 1994. He alleges that an acquaintance of Tracy's was responsible for her death, saying that he'd visited the store that night to tell her he had feelings for her, but turned violent when she told him she wanted to remain friends. According to the detective, he had brought the case to a grand jury, from which two-thirds voted to indict, but that the state attorney's office had declined to prosecute the case. While he claims that politics and personal agendas and people not doing their jobs are the reason the acquaintance was never arrested, Those involved in the case say the indictment was not pursued because of circumstantial evidence. To avoid a suspect being protected by double jeopardy, it's said they kept the case open in order to give future investigators the chance to obtain more evidence that would secure conviction. A final theory presented by online sleuths is that Tracy was a possible victim of the I-70 killer. The unknown serial killer is suspected of killing six store clerks in the Midwestern United States from 1992 to potentially 1994, with suspected victims in Indiana, Texas, Missouri, and Kansas. Those who follow this theory 
speculate that the I-70 killer was active prior to 1992. However, there is no evidence to suggest this, and as police have never identified a suspect in the murders, it's not known if he was actually involved in Tracy's death. Tracy's case has been featured on Unsolved Mysteries and A Current Affair. The Kirkpatrick remains in the Frederick area. They continue to keep Tracy's memory alive, holding regular vigils at the West Ridge Shopping Center each year. Every year, they commemorate her birthday by bringing either yellow roses or carnations to a cherry tree they planted in her honor at Brunswick High School. Tracy is said to have liked the cherry trees that blossom in Washington, D.C. In 2014, Deonda wrote a letter to her sister where she described making a photo collage as a Christmas gift for their parents in December 2013. She wrote that making the collage made her realize that Tracy's legacy continues to live on in her nieces and nephews. Digital creative specialist Paul Pelusi is currently working on a documentary called In the Silent Land, Who Killed Tracy Kirkpatrick? The family gave him permission to tell Tracy's story, and the film is said to currently be in production. Paglusi has set up a GoFundMe page to help fund it. Those with information regarding the murder of Tracy Kirkpatrick are asked to contact the Frederick Police Department at 301-600-6219.